everybody. My name is Demet Tunç. I lead the Customer Experience Council at the Conference Board. Today, uh, we will have the second part of a three-series webcast on customer experience and bots. Uh, in today's uh, webcast, we will talk about how to uh, revolutionize customer experience with data science and design thinking. I have uh, Mihir Sarkar with me. Before I introduce uh, my speaker and the content uh, of today's uh, webcast, let me update you on a couple of um, topics uh, to, um, to participate in this webcast. Uh, you can ask questions via the chat box at the bottom left of your screen. Uh, please pose them to me here whenever you want and at the right moment I will uh, let me here uh, get your question and he can answer. You can also download the presentation via the file download pod in the bottom center of your screen. Uh, if uh, you would like to uh, full uh, screen the video or the PowerPoint, we have a PowerPoint presentation, you can uh, click on the four arrows at the top right of your screen so that you see the full uh, uh, view on, on your computer. Uh, at the end of this webcast, we will have a brief evaluation form and we would be very happy if you complete that so that we improve ourselves for the future webcasts. You are free to share this webcast with your colleagues. It will be available on demand after the webcast on the website of the conference board. Uh, by joining this webcast, you also earn CP credits. To be able to do so, you need to stay online throughout the whole webcast and click on uh, the boxes with your name uh, each time it appears during the webcast. All right, that was all about the housekeeping rules. Um, Mihir, welcome. Uh, hi, Demet. Uh, thanks for uh, having me. I'm very pleased to be here. Yeah, we are very happy to have you. Um, to introduce me here, actually, he's got several titles. Uh, he's a consultant, he's an executive, he's an entrepreneur, a scientist, a designer. But his latest and newest title is that he is the head of data at NG Dig Digital, where he uses data science to help lead the zero carbon energy transition. Uh, as many people know, NG is an energy company and they focus on zero carbon energy transition and to enable that they use digital to help with this transition, which is very interesting. And today Mihir is going to share, us, share with us the examples, not only from NG, but also from uh, several different companies. Um, he, holds an, uh, he holds a PhD in media arts and scientists, uh, sciences from uh, MIT. He also teaches and, uh, and he's, he's a big fan of technology and data. And um, so it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here, uh, Mihir. And uh, let me start with a question. As, as I lead the Customer Experience Council for the conference board, uh, everything we talk about is customer experience. And there is a correlation between customer ex experience and the business performance of the companies. So from uh, your point of view, how does customer experience drive growth and what is the role of data in this equation? Uh, so I think that's a really interesting question and I think um, we, uh, we need to think about uh, customer experience as one of the enablers of uh, what a company's goal might be. And I think that's being uh, reshaped uh, as we speak. Uh, what, what is the goal of company? And I think some of uh, the reflections that we're having around these topics as a society um, at the moment, um, if, if we can have our audience think about these questions uh, in this discussion, I think we'll, we'll have achieved a, a great outcome. Um, is it that uh, the sole purpose of a company is to create value to its shareholders? Is it that we need to create value for all stakeholders? Uh, can we have a company and an organization uh, create positive impact, uh, both socially and environmentally? Uh, I think those are questions that are being asked by people uh, more and more and that we need to address. Um, and I think data science and design, which are new tools uh, in, the, in, in the tool set that is available to companies to uh, create value, uh, are topics that we, uh, that we increasingly look at uh, to answer those questions. So, so I think in terms of uh, this discussion, if uh, we provide more questions and avenues for reflection than answers, 
I think it's a good thing um, because I, there's this great quote that I like by uh, by Abraham Lincoln, which is uh, that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Uh, we're at the threshold where there's so much change happening uh, in society, in the way that we operate business, uh, that we need to invent new ways to think about what value is and how it can impact our lives and our uh, um, and and how uh, markets operate. Uh, so I think uh, I look at design and data as uh, ways to help in in that transition, in ways that uh, we can build frameworks to think about uh, those questions. And uh, some of the answers I'll provide by uh, talking about some of the experiences I've gone through uh, and what some of the other companies that I've uh, looked at have gone through. Uh, but I think it's it's a very open-ended question at the moment. Okay. We're excited to hear about it. So uh, so, so it's, it's funny that... Um, we don't have video in this uh, in this webcast, uh, unfortunately. But it reminds me of uh, some of my early experiences um, as uh, as a DJ at uh, MIT's uh, radio campus radio station, uh, WMBR. So it's old school radio. Um, it's it's a bit different from uh, the the traditional webcast format. Um, but I think we have. Uh, some technical issues that we're trying to deal with at the same time, but hopefully those will be sorted over time. Okay. Well, till we get the presentation on the screen, um, do you think that the companies can differentiate uh, themselves uh, in a world where they all uh, talk about customer experience and creating value for the customers, value propositions, uh, putting the customer at the heart of our of the business. So these are the terminology, the vocabulary all these companies are using. And now AI, data science, design thinking is the buzzword, the important word. But do you think when everybody in an environment talking about all of these, do you think that they have the ability to differentiate themselves? I think it's, uh, it's an interesting topic because customer experience is becoming at the center of attention in terms of um, how can a company provide value to uh, its customers. It's no longer a product, it's no longer service. I think there's been this uh, back and forth between, um, historically between um, the market being product driven, service driven. Uh, we then had mass product uh, manufacturing uh, available to uh, most of the world. Uh, and then the internet enabled uh, service at scale through uh, software as a service, through mobile apps. Uh, we're now with uh, Industry 4.0, as it's called, uh, able to produce customized products for, for people through 3D printing and, and technologies such as that. Um, could AI provide service, customized service at scale? Uh, that, that's an interesting question that uh, I think we haven't answered yet because uh, one of the most used um, business cases or use cases for AI uh, in industry is chatbots. Um, it's to replace customer service representatives uh, through an interface that is voice activated. And that doesn't provide um, a really good customer service uh, to, to, to most uh, users. I think um, a lot of people complain that uh, they want to talk to a real human. I think the performance levels of uh, chatbots still has a lot to improve. Uh, so I think we have a, a long way to go bef before we can provide uh, service at scale. But I think that's one of the goals of, of how AI can operate. Um, and I really like the, the quote that uh, Mark Andreessen, um, the founder of Netscape, uh, gave you know eight years ago, which is that software is eating the world. Um, because in every industry that we've seen, software has been what has disrupted that industry, whether it's, you know, hotel through Airbnb, whether it's uh, movies, whether it's music, whether it's uh, uh, transportation, software is, as the, is at the heart of, of that change. Uh, and I think we're now using software in a, in a different way because we're augmenting it with data. Um, and that wasn't really the case eight years ago. Uh, the, the renewal of uh, artificial intelligence came after 2012, approximately, in the industry. Uh, by a combination of, of several things. One is uh, that deep learning, which is uh, based on neural networks, which were an AI technology from several decades ago, uh, became relevant again 
because there were enough data sets to be able to train those models. There were some advances in algorithms that helped uh, deep learning became, become more popular. And there was also more processing power that allowed AI to become uh, almost a mainstream uh, technology. Uh, so with that, AI and data became at the forefront and the center of attention of, uh, of uh, business and organizations. Uh, but at the same time, the kind of technologies we use in data science and artificial intelligence is really uh, very little based on, on deep learning. There are a few use cases, things like uh, image recognition, video recognition, self-driving cars that may rely on the latest uh, artificial intelligence techniques. But a lot of uh, value we see in uh, some businesses are based on uh, traditional machine learning and techniques that were uh, available several decades ago. Uh, we have now more processing power to, to put those into action. And more importantly, we have data available, whether they're through uh, uh, IOTs, so uh, Internet of Things, sensors that are located in uh, places that allow us to capture data. Um, are various means for us to, to, to get access to data sets, whether they're our own or through uh, third party companies. Uh, and that really enabled companies to use the value of data and artificial intelligence to, to change the, the game. Um, and, and we've really seen since 2011 a shift from older IT departments, information technology, which was used to, uh, which used software to really improve business processes and systems inside a company to having uh, digital factories and digital organizations that use software plus data to transform the way the products and services of a company are, are offered, delivered, and impact the customer experience. Um, and I think that's really a shift in, in how technology now affects the core business and the core capabilities and value of, of an organization. I see. And is there, uh, or what is the most popular use case for AI amongst the companies. Everybody is talking about examples from Amazon's, Ubers, and so on, but do you have your favorite one? Well, uh, unfortunately, it's not a favorite one. Uh, chatbots, uh, like I was saying, uh, seem to occupy 70% of the use cases in, in industry. Um, I think it's a, it's a quick win uh, because it impacts uh, the bottom line pretty rapidly in terms of you know, the customer service uh, investment that needs to, to happen. Uh, when you deploy a, a bot. Um, but I think the value that can come from such technology is mitigated by the fact that the customer experience might suffer from um, early AI technologies that are not fully mature yet. Um, we're just seeing the beginning of voice technologies uh, having a foothold in, in the home through uh, Alexa, through uh, Google Home, uh, Siri, etc. So all the technology companies have an offering that um, allow people to interact with their voice for uh, home services, for ordering things online, for uh, controlling their uh, play music playlist, for example. Uh, so we have some use cases appearing in the voice domain. I don't know if uh, you remember the, the Google demo from a year ago where they had a Google voice assistant call a Chinese restaurant to order something um, to, I think, reserve a, a table. And it was free flowing uh, conversational AI, um, where even a person um, might have some difficulty communicating with the with the restaurant owner, but the AI was doing a great job. Uh, unfortunately, it was just at demo stage, and to transform that into a product that's robust enough to deploy at scale is uh, considerable work. So we haven't seen really the impact of having that uh, early stage R and D technology making it to market. So the kind of bots we see now. Uh, being deployed are still uh, decision trees that uh, make you choose one item in a menu of items. Uh, it's, it, it, it speeds up the, the, uh, the, the, the ability for, for people to, ha to receive some kind of help for most uh, common use cases uh, if you call customer service. But in many cases, the experience is diminished because you don't have that interaction, that empathy that you'd have with a, with a real human. Um, so then it's a trade-off. Are you uh, looking at short-term impact on your bottom line versus long-term retention of users based on a, a relationship you're building with them? And I think it's important to look at AI and, and ways to design an experience to create long-term um, relationships with, with your customers and your users. 
So actually, AI is really changing the way we do business. Um, and I know that you work with a broad range of industries and companies from small to big. So how would you differentiate or how would you see the maturity levels of these companies? Is it the size of the company that matters, uh, that impacts their connection to uh, AI? Or is it the mentality? Is it the speed of change? Is it the entrepreneurial uh, spirit that the companies are using AI to change the way they do business? Um, I think it really depends on the vision of, of those who are in charge. I think I've, when, when you look at technology companies in Silicon Valley, uh, the big ones like Apple and and uh, and um, uh, Google, um, or if you go to Seattle, Amazon and Microsoft, they all share the same pool of of workers of you know white collar workers, engineers, um, marketing people, business people, uh, but they still have a differentiated offer. They have a different strategy, and that comes from the top. So there's still a lot of weight to be uh, put on the vision of the company, the people who run the organization and the, the, the vision and the strategy of where a, a technology organization wants to go. Um, so the differentiation comes from uh, getting some information from the bottom up, from your users, from understanding what the, your customers' needs are and how to satisfy them and trying to solve problems for them, but also having this creative moment that comes from a combination of data insights and, uh, and design thinking um, and really using your left brain and your right brain to come up with a vision and a strategy that everybody in your organization can subscribe to. Uh, and there's a very strong push. Um, maybe the, the pendulum has swung back to, to having more, more of a top-down approach to uh, innovation and thinking of disruption as a, a mechanism, as a repeatable routine mechanism that you can use in a big organization to compete with uh, maybe itself, maybe a uh, big organization needs to, to be able to disrupt itself to, to be able to, uh, to adapt to change. Uh, it's no longer protecting yourself from uh, startups and smaller organizations that, uh, that might take over your industry. It's being able to grow organically, uh, implement some of the tools that uh, allow you to, uh, to compete with yourself so that when uh, the, the market is mature, when um, the demand is there, then you can offer new products and services that uh, that might cannibalize some of your older offerings, but that will lead you to a long-term growth. I see. As in everything, uh, it starts with the senior management. If they walk to the talk, uh, the employers will also uh, follow them. And it starts with the vision and the strategy of any business. Yeah, we, we see that, uh, that top-down trickle uh, happen very... Uh, very organically in some sense, when you have a vision that you, you want to share. And I think we, we see that at NG as well, where the zero energy transition, zero carbon energy tra transition is something that um, a lot of people can subscribe to within the organization. And um, it's declined in, in what we call decarbonization, um, decentralization, and digitalization. And those are the three levers that we can use to help in that energy transition. And we see that, um, uh, that at, at every uh, part of the organization, uh, whether it's uh, business units or uh, entities within those business units, um, we, we can subscribe to, to a common vision in order to be able to implement that into current projects and, and services and product offerings. Um, so I have a few examples of companies that have disrupted their industry. And the fact that they use a combination of data and design to, to do that. Uh, so the first example here is Airbnb. And I found that really interesting because they really moved from a uh, provider of, of uh, hotel-like rooms or lodging to uh, creating experiences for uh, their customers. Um, so a few months ago, there, there was a big uh, advertising campaign in Paris where they were offering a uh, night stay in the Louvre uh, Museum for, for two uh, with a uh, whole night dinner and an orchestra playing uh, especially for you. Uh, that that might be up a bit upscale for for many, but there's a lot of experiences that you can now avail of uh, that are very uh, tailored to your particular tastes and needs uh, when you go on the Airbnb platform. Uh, and Airbnb has really adapted from 
pushing the boundaries of, of uh, what can be done within the realms of the city, how the city is evolving, um, and, and really adapting to uh, new legislations within cities that uh, limit the amount of, uh, of uh, lodging that can be put for short-term rental, for example. So it's a, it's a real interplay between uh, policy, between uh, your strategy, and between using technology and user experience uh, focused thinking to, to adapt to that. Um, so, so that's an interesting example um, in, in the technology space. Uh, another example is that of, uh, of Netflix. And I, I use these companies because uh, even though they provide a service that may be more or less tangible, um, they really are data companies that uh, either provide entertainment or provide uh, an experience, uh, a physical experience at a location or lodging um, or transportation. But at the core, what makes them uh, unique and what differentiates them from uh, the industry as it was before is the use of data. Uh, so, for example, Netflix as a product experience is different for every user. It really depends on your user profile, what your preferences are, uh, what are the previous movies that you that you liked, uh, and that over time has evolved. Uh, if you were an early user of Netflix, you might remember that you had five stars to rate uh, a movie out of. Uh, now it's just a thumbs up or thumbs down. So their mechanism to uh, uh, learn to enable their machines to learn your preferences uh, is based on on your feedback uh, from movies, but also on your consumption behavior. So if you let uh, Netflix propose the, the, the following movie for you when you don't do anything, you'll have an infinite playlist that, uh, that keeps you awake at night. And, uh, and the CEO of Netflix famously said once that uh, his com competition is not other streaming services, it's sleep. So they actually want you to consume as much content as possible. And if they do that, if you do that, it means that they've reached their goal of providing the most accurate content for you. Um, another example is, um, is that of Uber. And uh, under the guise of a transportation company, it's actually a, a data company that's really user-centric and that has used the customer experience as its uh, market differentiator. Um, I remember um, first using Uber when I was a student in Boston uh, at a conference. They had a discount code that was available that allowed me to uh, download the app and use it for the first time almost for free. It, I think it had a $20 limit, which was more than I could use for, for my first trip. Um, and the whole onboarding experience was seamless. Um, you didn't have to uh, create an account, but you still had to enter your credit card information. And they were one of the first few apps that uh, allowed you to take a picture of your credit card so you didn't have to enter all the numbers manually. Um, so interestingly, they've moved away from that now. But at the time, it was such a seamless experience, it didn't take more than a, a minute to do that. Even if the first ride uh, was free, they didn't charge the credit card, they had the information in, on, uh, on hand in the app uh, for future rides. And because my experience with the app was so seamless the first time, I didn't hesitate in using it again. Uh, so this transition, this conversion from having uh, the app on your device of having a seamless customer experience that really provided value uh, was key to, to retaining their users. Um, but in addition to that, they really had a lot of uh, insights come from their data. And they realized that uh, one of the examples that, come from, that comes from Uber um, uh, pretty often is the fact that they realized that they had a magic number, which was five minutes. If a customer waited less than five minutes for a taxi, they would rate their experience as superlative and they would come back to the app because it was a much better experience than hailing a taxi on the, on the street. So, uh, so, so that kind of magic number is very often what organizations ask of their data scientists. They tell them, you know, here's a bunch of data from customer uh, behavior, try to come up with, you know, what's going to help us convert those customers and retain them in the long run. But mo in most cases, it's very hard to find, and they may not be such a such a easy win in terms of getting insights from the data. Uh, and what we need to do in those cases is to create a link between the business and uh, the data scientists in order to be able to um, look at uh, data in the light of what you're trying to improve. So even if it's incremental improvements in uh, reducing the 
uh, churn or uh, improving the conversion in the in the sales funnel. Uh, those are initial steps that you need to take with data scientists and uh, in order to be able to uh, to to prove that to, to prove value to create value out of uh, your data. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how to implement that uh, more formally in an organization. Um, but I think this this magic uh, this idea that that a magic number can pop out and help you gain insights from from data um, needs to evolve. I see. About Uber, I've heard something related to India. I don't know if it is specific to India, but uh, apparently the consumers are not a big fan of Uber in India because um, they call a cab and uh, when the driver comes, uh, they tell the driver where they want to go and the driver doesn't want to go there. So you end up with unhappy customers. I don't know how this works in Europe, whether the driver also has the option to choose the customer because at the end of the day, it's the full customer experience. It, it, yes, it is from the customer point of view, but if the driver comes all the way to your place and says, well, sorry, I don't want to go to that place, then you end up with an unhappy customer. And I heard that Uber is not used. Actually, there's uh, it's hated in, in India because of this. Uh, have you heard of this um, incident? Uh, I haven't heard of this specific incident, but I know that there's been several uh, backlash against Uber in, in India uh, or in various countries in Asia. Uh, and I think that's interesting because it brings out a point of cultural differences. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of uh, the limits of AI, and we'll talk about some of uh, the other limits of, of data and, and data science and artificial intelligence, is the fact that um, the the algorithms and the, the, the customer experience around it are very often designed uh, in a particular cultural region and with particular cultural stereotypes that usually match um, Western male uh, designers and developers that, that make up the bulk of, of technology organizations. Um, and, uh, and when you transpose some of these experiences elsewhere, they don't always take into account um, the, the peculiarities of, of other regions in the world. Um, so one size fits all approach across the world would not work, and, and, and that's countries a bit, uh, are aware of this. Yeah, so so uh, that's a bit of a, a limitation of the statistical approach that that AI traditionally uses, and I think we need to do a better job in terms of how to adopt that technology to make more customized uh, recommendations or predictions um, around the customer experience, both at an individual level and at a, a cultural level, uh, and some. Technology organizations have taken that into account. Uh, for example, Google Maps in India uh, is based less on uh, street names and, and house numbers than it is on landmarks and uh, and uh, and, and uh, locations that might be less uh, uh, have less of an identifier to them. Um, it's it's a bit when you like when you ask your way around uh, in India, they'll tell you you know take the second left and they don't know the name of the street and the name of the street might have changed and and uh, things evolve pretty rapidly um, but you'll you'll get there because you you stop at every intersection and ask someone <laughs> and, and google maps has actually been able to adapt to that way of, of uh, locating places um, and is doing a pretty job a good job at that with local teams that look at do, that do anthropological research for example and look at uh, talk to people to understand how they uh, move into uh, into space, into geography. Um, so anthropological research is one of the core aspects of, of design thinking um, in being able to shadow uh, your users, your customers, and trying to understand what, from their point of view, how they operate instead of, uh, uh, of, of pushing a technology to them, adapting the technology to their real, real needs. I see. I very much like the example because there always needs to be the human touch, the human connection, even though if uh, it's the machine learning. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And I think it's an interesting uh, uh, se segue to, to this uh, to this slide um, because we we used to think of uh, AI in light in the light in the light of uh, the Turing test. Uh, so Turing was a computer scientist, uh, a British computer scientist from uh, the early 20th century, who did a lot, contributed a lot to, to the field. Um, 
And one of his um, famous takes on AI was the fact that he uh, defined what an AI should be by saying if you put an artificial intelligence and a human operator uh, in a room that's separated from a user, and the user has a text textual interface, so a keyboard and a screen, for example, and interacts once with uh, the computer and once with the human. If that user can't differentiate between both, it means that the AI is, is powerful enough and has reached its goal of being a general intelligence. Um, and, and we see that that test is no longer relevant because we've probably reached the stage where in many cases, um, the differentiation between a human and a computer is no longer um, identifiable. Uh, and, and in retrospect, we, we actually see that, that we as humans have to prove to the computer that we're no longer robots, that we're not robots. Mm -hmm. and, and that's uh, you know, the CAPTCHA test. The fact that uh, in many cases, um, the computers have become so powerful and they can do many tasks that we used to do better than us, that we have to uh, show our limitations and, uh, and, and prove to, to the machines that, that we're still human, that we have flowers and that we, uh, that we breathe and, and, have, uh, and, and exist as a, as a separate entity. Um, so I think that's an interesting philosophical take on what's the role of, uh, of humans in the human-machine interaction, uh, both for business and, 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 social, and socially. Um, I would like to remind to the audience that you can ask questions to me here directly by typing your question in the chat box here and I will pose the question to him when it's appropriate. Um, so I thought I'll, I'll go into a few examples of uh, the kinds of use cases we have uh, at NG in terms of both AI and, uh, and design thinking. Uh, so it started off with uh, improving operational efficiency and for example, improving um, the ability to produce as much energy as uh, needed by our cons consumption behavior. So for example, if uh, the weather is warm, we might need to produce less because, um, because we, we don't use our heaters as much. Uh, if it's daytime, we, we use less uh, electricity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we can apply that to renewable sources of energy, uh, both for um, energy effic efficiency, as well as uh, things like predictive maintenance. Uh, which means that we can detect when an element has uh, failures before those happen so that we can uh, send an operator on site to replace uh, for example a, a wind turbine um, element or, or uh, a motor uh, or an asset uh, and that's enabled by having both iot devices at the edge that track uh, and monitor the, the functioning of every, uh, every asset. Uh, we can also have cameras that, for example, take uh, photographs to uh, look at the, 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 sta the, the state of, of these assets. For example, if there's, there's been hail and uh, one of those elements is, uh, uh, is broken or is, uh, uh, needs to be changed, we can, we can send someone. Uh, at the same time, the business case around it needs to be evaluated because uh, very often when you think about AI in theory, you don't think so much about uh, how much it's going to cost. Um, and AI does cost quite a bit because we use data centers, we use processing power, and uh, those need to be balanced with the benefit that it can uh, bring to the, uh, the organization. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in terms of, uh, of energy consumption as well. But another use case that's uh, pretty interesting to, to us is looking at how humans operate in homes, in buildings, and also in, in cities and, and institutions. Uh, so we now talk about smart homes. Uh, many of us who have uh, util who, who deal with utility companies have uh, smart uh, meters at home, uh, both for electricity and gas, uh, sometimes for water as well. And those send data back to the utility company for them to be able to analyze your uh, behavior, uh, predict how much you're going to spend by the end of the month, compare your spend with uh, similar households, and give you feedback uh, that will, over time, enable you to change your behavior, or at least monitor it. And the goal here is to actually uh, educate the consumers by providing data and visualizations back to them. 
Um, and that's very important um, in terms of uh, training people to consume less energy, for example, uh, but also to try to uh, to um, to reduce their 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 bill at the end of the month and, and consume less overall. Uh, and we have a project uh, with universities as well, where we uh, provide energy as a service. In that we uh, we we uh, take over um, the infrastructure, we manage it, and we provide uh, what uh, what I would describe as uh, you want uh, as a service. It means that you want um, your light to be on when it's dark. You want heat to be on when it's cold. Uh, you want water to be warm when you when you need it, but you don't want to be the one who's who changes the light bulb or who uh, um, maintains the the hot water pipes, um, etc. And uh, what you want is is a company that takes care of the service for you. So you pay them to take care of the infrastructure and to maintain your equipment so that you your service is uninterrupted and you you just pay something like a similar to a subscription uh, model. Uh, so we do that and, and now. It, it, you, you say you, uh, you have to pay for it. So this is the companies are asking premium for the service. So it's the model towards which NG, for example, is, is uh, moving towards. Um, and it would be uh, it, it would be something that that's longer term. So you retain your customers longer. Uh, it's the same kind of subscription model that you would have in software. Uh, but here it's much longer term. So, for example, the the. Uh, proposal we have with universities is over several decades where uh, NG can take care of the infrastructure, work with a financing partner to uh, invest upfront uh, what it needs to, to be able to uh, uh, operate the equipment and take over the equipment because uh, many universities in the US have their own power generating plants. Um, so if an organization takes over that part of the infrastructure, they're able to provide energy as a service in a way that uh, is seamless for the uh, staff, the, the, the students, uh, the professors, and the university can then focus on their core business, which is education and, and sports, et cetera, uh, for, their, uh, for their main stakeholders. Um, and that's a pretty interesting model that uh, shifts from, from previous uh, ways of thinking about how energy is provided as a utility. Um, so another example here is uh, in cities, and we use a lot of uh, data to do image and video processing. Uh, for example, to reduce uh, the amount of pollution that comes from traffic. So if you can optimize the flow of traffic by identifying the number of vehicles in a particular area of the city, uh, you might be able to change the flow of uh, red lights and green lights uh, at particular intersections or in particular districts so that the flow um, uh, eases up when, when needed. And you can have dashboards that allow operators to monitor the situation. Um, so those kinds of smart cities go hand in hand with smart institutions, with smart homes, with smart uh, buildings in creating an ecosystem where um, artificial intelligence and the whole customer experience around being able to monitor your uh, usage, your behavior, being able to alter your behavior based on your feedback creates a virtuous, virtuous loop uh, that al allows you to, uh, to reduce consumption and to uh, improve your, your, uh, your service to users. I think these are great examples, um, but I also see that the communication plays an important part. Um, I do not know how aware the consumers are of all these nice features that the companies offer. So it's actually the value proposition of the companies that they have these great examples. Uh, but I'm not sure if it's properly communicated to educate the consumers uh, so that they consume less, they, they are more um, environmentally friendly, and they know about their consumption and how it costs for them. So um, there's, there's a bit of lack in my opinion in the communication that's, part that's of absolutely it. true i think i think uh, the tools are available now for people to go onto a portal on on the website of their utility uh, and monitor the consumption look at visualizations and, and compare their behavior with others um, but how often do people actually go onto that portal and, and and look at that and actually 
consciously alter their behavior. So I think there needs to be uh, a, a thorough rethink of how um, the ecosystem needs to be built around uh, the customer experience. I think we're still at the early stages of providing some tools, but it needs to be looked at holistically. And design thinking is, uh, you know, an anthropological research, so shadowing people, looking at how they, uh, how in their day, uh, when would be the most opportune moment for them, for, for the company to push a notification, for example, to, uh, to look at, you know, what's happening um, so that they, they have an incentive to go back, look at it. Uh, maybe the incentive might be that their bill is reduced at the end of the month. Maybe their incentive is to um, gamify the experience and, and look at how they're, well they're doing compared to their neighbors or their, um, their, their friends. So there's ways to think about the experience as a whole uh, that are still at, at very, very early stages, I, I, I agree. Zero carbon energy transition. I like this. <laughs> so NG has been focusing um, lately on uh, um, ridding itself of its uh, assets that, that produce CO2 uh, in order to focus more and more over time uh, in renewables and assets that, uh, that are carbon neutral. And to help in that transition, there's both an aspect that's linked to decentralization and the fact that there are now microgrids that can provide enough energy for uh, local communities or, or individual homes uh, to, for, for their own consumption, uh, but also the use of digital tools, both through software and data, to be able to, like I said, monitor your consumption, alter your behavior. And it's still very early stages, like you, uh, you pointed out, and we need to be able to improve from there to be able to think of it holistically in order to, uh, to, to incorporate the environment uh, and the whole ecosystem in making sure that we uh, we can reach uh, uh, the goal of, of being carbon neutral or uh, reducing our carbon emissions. And what do you think are the biggest challenges for the companies to implement data strategy in an organization? So I was mentioning um, price as being uh, consequential sometimes for, for uh, AI and technologies that run on the cloud. And it's sometimes something that's uh, very often overlooked. Um, and it's to be noted that uh, AI has its own carbon footprint. Um, so there was a study that was done um, by the MIT Technology Review recently that showed that uh, to train a model that was for natural language processing, um, so a pretty complex model um, with 200 million parameters, the amount of computation needed to train that model was equivalent to the CO2 emission of uh, five cars in the US, including manufacturing and their whole lifetime. Wow. Uh, so something like 300 tons of uh, CO2 produced uh, by the uh, energy required to power the computers and the data center um, that, uh, that was needed to, to train the model. So you don't always train models that are as complex, but it can happen. And very often when you're a data scientist sitting uh, in your organization far from uh, the data center, far from the cloud, that's very transparent to you. You're not the one receiving the bill. Uh, you're just running your models, you're training something, your, uh, your results might work more or less. So you iterate and you train another model with uh, different parameters. And that process of uh, back and forth uh, might be quite transparent to you as an as a engineer and data scientist, but they, real, they really have an impact on uh, the carbon footprint of the technology organization and, uh, and the costs. So that needs to be taken into account. Um, there's also um, a lot of discussions these days around the biases of AI and uh, the ethics of AI. Um, there was uh, uh, an experiment recently, um, well, I think that started in 2014 or 2015 by Amazon about creating an artificial intelligence to, uh, for the recruitment process to screen resumes. And the goal for them was uh, to say, out of 1,000 resumes they receive, if they can shortlist the top five, then they would be able to save so much time and effort and, and uh, money in the process. Um, they realized, however, that the data set that trained the, the models uh, were so heavily biased on the current population of uh, AI, uh, of sorry, Amazon engineers, um, that 
the system, the model would actually uh, reject most female applicants <laughs> and select only on the male applicants. And the reason was there must be like a word the uh, hum uh, the females are using on their CV, which the males are not using. Absolutely. So females were using things like, you know, women's basketball team or so things like that that were appearing. So they did, uh, they, they also tried to remove a bias by removing the identification of, of words that were gender, uh, gender uh, mm -hmm. non-gender neutral. But at the same time, the, the, the algorithm didn't significantly improve because there are a lot of hidden variables in, uh, in someone's identity, uh, whether it's uh, the kind of activities that uh, someone would do, uh, whether they're, they're uh, you know, male or female, um, even if uh, not looking at gender, but looking at, at uh, uh, social class, for example, uh, if you look at zip codes that might influence, you know, where you're coming from, what your neighborhood might be, what your upbringing might be. Um, and, and it's been shown that even if you try to remove uh, explicit objective keywords and features from a model, um, there are hidden variables that uh, create stereotypes that perpetuate through uh, training models and through the data sets, even unconsciously. So uh, that's something that um, you need to, to be aware of so that you can uh, guard against it. Um, but it has real world implications. So for example, these, uh, um, what I was talking about in terms of zip codes identifying someone's uh, economic status might be used for uh, uh, credit scoring and for uh, giving loans out to people. Um, and if you have a negative loan application because you have certain features that uh, put you in a certain category uh, that might or might not be fair, but it's what the AI tells uh, the, the bankers, and you you have all uh, the rights to, to, to be upset about that uh, because uh, AI is still an evolving technology and we're just learning about these these biases. So how will the humans and the machines interact with each other? Uh, so at the moment, it's uh, uh, more or less a legal requirement in, in many jurisdictions that uh, an AI that puts out a decision that affects someone's uh, that an outcome, whether it's in health or in finance, uh, it needs to be explained. So, so the human operator explained, explained to the to the end user to, to the, the end consumer. User. If if the consumer asks for the reason why their loan was rejected, for example, the human operator should be able to tell these are the features that uh, made you unfit for it. Um, and very often, the, some of the new AI technologies that, uh, that, we, uh, that we see, like deep learning, are a bit of a black box. So the way that they're trained and the way that they uh, appear uh, to end users are, um, are, are, are not explainable. So, so there needs to be either further work and research into making deep learning algorithms more explainable, or they, needs to be, uh, they, they need to use uh, older machine learning techniques that have more straightforward uh, explainability. Um, another aspect of uh, limitation of AI is, uh, is in the field of ethics. Um, and that's an interesting example because um, many in the audience might be familiar with uh, the the trolley problem, the fact that if you have a self-driving car or something similar that's automated um, and you have in one path five people who have had an accident and are lying on the tracks versus uh, another direction if the, the car has only two options, the other direction where there's only one person, uh, you as the operator of the vehicle, what decision can you make and should you make uh, should you crush five people or should you crush just one person? <laughs> um, so that's the classic trolley problem that that's studied in, in the ethics of AI. Uh, but MIT Technology Review recently uh, uh, did a study where they said, okay, let's make this a bit more uh, complicated and, and closer to a real world scenario where you might have um, an older person on one path of the, the self-driving car and a baby on the other. And... Uh, I'm curious to hear what uh, what what people in the audience or you would would choose to to do. Would you, if you as an operator were able to select um, one path for the car versus the other, uh, or if you were the designer of the algorithm that uh, 
created the AI that powered the car, would you decide to uh, run over the old lady or would you decide to run over the, the, the baby? Is there not an option C that you stop sometimes and wait? Th- sometimes there isn't. Maybe there's a, there's a huge truck going really fast behind the car and you can't stop because it'll be a huge accident. Um, and what they found is that uh, there are cultural differences to the answer. So a lot of countries um, that have more of an individualistic culture chose uh, to save the baby and uh, and you know go for the, the kill, old lady. Kill the, kill the woman, kill <laughs> and, the old uh, woman. And, and many countries in Asia and uh, elsewhere, Finland was in that group actually also, uh, chose to, to uh, save, uh, to, to go for the baby and, and save the old lady. Um, so, so there are cultural differences that are pretty significant um, that influence that kinds of decisions. So there's a whole field around the ethics of AI and how uh, we should train models and technology to, to make decisions that might be too fast for a human to make. Um, insurances have their own mechanisms, so they would say that we've got a different model for the cost of the life of the old woman versus the cost of the baby. Uh, is that a model that we want technology to follow? Or do we uh, need to make decisions around that? And I think that's an open question. Uh, actually, you say that you, they ask the consumers what they think the best option. And uh, sometimes uh, customer insights, consumer insights may be misleading and they may not be enough. Um, Steve Jobs once said, if you ask people a century ago how they wanted their transportation to improve, the answer would have been faster horses. And, uh, and if the companies have followed this consumer insight, uh, we would not be uh, talking about self-driving cars at the moment. So that's why the responses across the world, including Finland, uh, may not be the right um, way to make decisions, actually, for the companies, right? Right. That's, a, that's an interesting point. And I think that comes back to this uh, tension between bottom-up and top-down and the fact that design thinking is a process that allows companies to expand the range of possibilities by uh, focusing on what users ask and what they say and how they behave. But at the same time, it's important not to do, uh, I think that there's been a shift from uh, user-focused groups and, uh, and market research to uh, really looking at behavior and doing, uh, and, and trying to understand how uh, people live their lives or, or have a workflow uh, in their business that uh, can be altered and getting that information and combining it with insights that you might have from data that allows you to converge into a solution that is maybe more top-down driven that uh, that that disrupts a bit the current thinking and it's usually through the process of uh, creating a hypothesis experimenting with it and then iterating and uh, trying out whether something works um, apple uh, which is uh, famously known for uh, for not testing their products uh, in beta version before releasing them, unlike uh, Google, um, released products that were unsuccessful unsuccessful at first, like uh, Newton, for example, which took years before the the market was ready to accept. Um, you, so you know, it's something that that was very similar to uh, what the iPhone could do, you know, ten years or fifteen years later. Um, so so I think there's this. Uh, back and forth and tension between um, what might be uh, insightful hypothesis that you want to test as a business and as a a vision setter within your organization and the kinds of data you can get both from analyzing quantitative um, uh, data from from your customers and getting uh, qualitative insights from uh, doing design uh, thinking. so maybe to, to uh, wrap up, uh, we might look at um, the, so, so I'll, I'll skip this one, which is, uh, which is why data uh, is important in an organization, because it uh, helps you move past opinions. Yeah, but, but um, don't skip, because I think it's interesting. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, we are talking about data science, the design thinking, and uh, we're also trying to link that to the business performance of a company. So how does data design thinking impact the bottom line? That's the first question I have. Mm-hmm. And the second question is, if it impacts, 
I know the answer is yes, but when it impacts, how do you measure the impact of it? So, so there are very quick wins that one can do with design thinking and, and, uh, and uh, data science. Um, and I see data science as uh, technologies that make use of data for improving uh, business processes, for example, and, and products. And uh, let me go to this, this slide here because uh, it shows the uh, value addition that data science and design thinking can bring to an, an organization. So starting from the bottom, you can uh, just reporting data, allowing your management to visualize the metrics uh, that drive your organization, both in terms of uh, leading and trailing metrics, allow you to provide uh, significant value to be able to know the state of uh, your business in order to be able to set targets and and uh, and uh, set objectives for the, the organization. Uh, following that, you can do product analytics, which means analyzing the, the cons consumer journey, um, customer behavior, um, and then looking at user insights like psychographic measures of uh, who are your customers, uh, not only demographics, but also how they think, how they operate, what drives them, what are their um, uh, how do they incorporate your product or service in their daily lives or their uh, their workflow? Um, and those kinds of insights come from a combination of looking at uh, the data for people who already use your product and looking at qualitative uh, information from um, uh, looking at uh, how you know design thinking approaches can help in uh, exploring uh, potential users or users that. Uh, that you're targeting for a product that's not yet built. Um, so those kinds of insights, when combined, can help you focus on improving your bottom line because you then can optimize your conversion funnel, uh, and that has a di direct impact on, on uh, the sales uh, of your organization, for example. So you can improve things like your website, direct website sales. And this, um, this framework does not implicitly suggest the sequence, right? It's, it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, imply that there's a sequence to it, but mm -hmm. very often an organization that starts from scratch in terms of its data science capabilities uh, might start from the bottom because very often uh, because data science and AI cost uh, some amount of money uh, at scale, you want to start small and you want to prove value to your board in order to be able to show that you're um, that you can actually do, quite a bit that impacts the bottom line with very little uh, upfront investment. So you have a few open source applications and software that allow you to uh, create value initially. And that those are usually at the bottom of this, uh, uh, of the, of this value uh, matrix. Uh, as you move up, you can then lead towards database features, which are uh, product-based features that are uh, based on the, the real-time behavior of consumers. Uh, and that's something, for example, that Netflix would do with uh, its uh, uh, its automatically updated um, uh, front page based on customer behavior. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Mihir. I feel like we could continue this talk for hours, uh, and I think we will after this webcast. Don't go. Stay with me, and we can even talk more. Uh, as, as I said at the start of this webcast, I lead the Customer Experience Council, and uh, these are our hot topics. Uh, these are the challenges that the six leaders across the industries are facing. So if you want to hear more about uh, these kind of topics, uh, please get in contact with my colleagues uh, at the conference board to join this peer networking group. And uh, we would also be very happy if you um, fill in the brief evaluation form. It's the first time that the video has not worked, um, so technology was not on our side today, but the content of this webcast was, uh, in my opinion, very interesting. And uh, I hope we do another one with a video working this time here. All right, thanks so much, Limit. <laughs> Thank you very much.